for this kind introduction. Thank you all for joining us for today's session. I could see from your short introductions that um, uh, I have a chance to talk to a very diverse, very international audience from Latin America, from different parts of, um, of, of Europe, which is fantastic. And so um, I'm, I look very much forward to uh, familiarizing you with, uh, with what is actually one chapter of a book project on which I'm working right now. And it is also um, a, a presentation which I have given just a couple of days ago at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel, uh, where we already had a very lively debate on it. And so um, I hope I can present you some, some new aspects to, to the topic of biofuels, which, uh, which is just not state of the art, which is not something that everybody knows. And I hope I can achieve this by um, drawing in particular on the case of Germany. So um, today's topic um, is public acceptance for biofuels. Um, this is um, uh, before we before we start uh, with uh, with the more um, the, with the more specific points I would like to address. We should all be on the same page with regard to what biofuels actually are. Um, I can see from your backgrounds that most of you work in the field of energy transport, and so to you, um, it, it should be clear that biofuels are um, liquid or gaseous uh, transport fuels. Uh, which are made, uh, which uh, which contain com elements from biodiesel or bioethanol, and um, the biodiesel and the bioethanol are produced from biomass. So this is what makes them a biofuel, effectively. The main producers in the world, and this is why I'm so happy that we also have a participant amongst us from from Brazil. Um, you can see here that the United States are one of the major producers of biofuels, but uh, Brazil is number two worldwide, and then it's uh, it's followed by Germany. Germany actually has um, an established um, history of a biodiesel production. And, uh, and uh, I can already tell you that today we will talk a lot about Germany, because despite the fact that we have um, an established biodiesel um, economy uh, industry, we, had, we faced some trouble in Germany when, when biofuels were introduced here for, uh, for, for broader consumption by car drivers. So um, the, the topic uh, we will be talking about today is actually this specific type of fuel, which contains um, up to 10% bioethanol. It's the fuel type called uh, Super E10. And uh, it was introduced in Germany in 2011. And what we were going to do uh, together is to take a look at the introduction process, uh, what, what uh, expected and unexpected problems policymakers in Germany encountered when this uh, new fuel type um, was introduced, and, and also what the biofuels market looks like uh, in Germany at this point in time. So the structure of the presentation looks as follows. Um, we, we need to talk a little bit about the European Union's uh, policy on biofuels, just, just to set the background of, of, the, of the presentation. Then we will take a detailed look at how E10, this is the blend uh, fuel type I, um, I just uh, showed you, here, if I can just quickly flip back, um, how this was introduced in Germany. Then we will talk um, uh, a bit more about like what, what the characteristics of the introduction process were. Um, and then we turn to the public opinion on E10. And uh, the conclusions will, be, uh, the, will form the final part of this presentation. And then I look very much forward to the Q&A session with you. So um, in the European Union be started to become interested in, in biofuels or in the promotion of biofuels in the early 2000s. And there were three motivations why the European Union started to explore the possibility of, of promoting biofuel use in the European Union. So first of all is that oil reserves diminish. Uh, the second one is that, um, and, and I mean, related to its supply declines, and then prices rise sharply. So this is an argument which is closely associated with the so-called uh, peak oil scenario, which has been very popular um, for a couple of years, which becomes more and more um, controversially debated. Um, but, uh, but this has been the rationale uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, to, um, to start promoting biofuels. The second motivation um, can be seen in um, the European Union's commitment to combating climate change and to reduce carbon as well as other uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the third reason is um, that there's a 
growing global transport sector, which is dependent on fossil fuel, and uh, and so uh, biofuels were seen um, as a possibility to um, to reduce this dependence on, on on fossil fuel and also to bring in some diversification of uh, fuel um, sources. So um, what I would like to do now is to uh, empirically illustrate the points which uh, which um, relate to the motiv motivation of the European Union to embrace this policy. And what you can see here is, is the development of prices. Um, um, for uh, for different types of fuels, and what we have here is we have the net prices that is without the taxes and levies on them, and what we see here is that uh, first of all um, the prices tend to fluctuate. Um, th this is perfectly reasonable because um, because oil, um, diesel, um, all, all types of uh, fossil fuels and oil derivatives they are traded on global markets, and so they are subject to um, to to market effects and to price volatility. Uh, what we see that um, in uh, beginning in the year 2005 until 2008, the, uh, the prices for different types of fuel products were increasing. Then there was a relatively sharp decrease in 2008, which had to do with the global uh, economic and financial crisis. And then afterwards, oil prices went up again um, until 2014, um, or actually the, the, the climax was in 2012, but then st uh, slowly starting to decrease. Um, and ever since, oil prices have been decreasing. But what is important to remember here is that the European Union started with its policy on biofuel promotion in 2003. And that was the time when the expectations of the policymakers was that the, that the prices for fossil fuels would increase and not decrease. So this is important to keep in mind. And uh, so, um, in a way, the actual empirical developments uh, didn't, were not supported by, by how the, the prices developed then eventually uh, in reality. But the expectation was one where, where policymakers just expected the prices to, to increase for, for conventional uh, fuels. And then um, the empirical support for, for the second motivation, which was, uh, which was about um, carbon uh, dioxide emissions, um, uh, can be seen here. This is a graph uh, I extracted from, uh, from the website of the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency. And here you can actually see uh, which world region contribute to what degree to, um, to car global carbon dioxide emissions. Um, I would particularly like to draw your attention to Europe because um, you can see that uh, the European Union had a relatively um, like constant contribution to global carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but th the tendency is one which is mar like slightly decreasing. So the contribution of Europe is relatively stable to the overall uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, this is differently, this is markedly different for Asia, uh, where over time the contribution of this re world region um, has, has, uh, has increased. Uh, the same holds true for the United States states and also other world regions. But for the European context, we can say that over time, the contribution has not increased, but rather decreased, but not to, to large extents. But, but it's, it's not um, the area which we would expect to, to, have, to like have an increasing contribution to, to global warming. And this is um, um, some empirical support for the third uh, motivation, which I just presented you. And it shows you um, the um, greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, from the transport sector. You can see like which different uh, um, transport modes contribute um, um, to, to what extent to greenhouse gas emissions. So we see that road transport is, is the biggest chunk, actually, uh, followed by aviation and, and then and navigation more generally. Generally, but it's uh, but the main concern to the European Commission has been um, the emissions stemming from road transport, and this was uh, one of the rationales for embracing um, the promotion of biofuels. So um, in 2000. 
free, there was the first um, um, directive adopted by the European Union to promote um, the use of biofuels um, in the European Union. That directive was criticized for several reasons. Um, one of them was that um, there were arguments advanced that the production of biofuels would not be sustainable. and. Uh, and so some member states simply abstained from uh, from complying with the requirements of that directive but uh, but nevertheless the european union uh, did not want to give up on that on this policy approach but what they did was that they adopted a new um, directive the so called renewable energy directive that was in 2009 where they uh, where the european union defined that by 2020 10% um, of the transport fuel of every eu country should come from renewable sources such as biofuels so this directive does not require the member states to uh, blend and in biofuels, um, what it requires them is to replace 10% um, of the fuel by renewable sources. Um, but, um, of course, uh, one very feasible way of attaining this goal is uh, by, do, by substituting conventional or fossil fuels by, by biofuels. So um, together with that uh, renewable energy directive, uh, a second directive was adopted in the same year. Uh, again, we're talking about 2009, as it is also indicated by the name of the directive. And uh, this is the so-called fuel quality directive, which, uh, which outlines um, how um, blend, uh, blended fuel types should look like, so what the quality requirements would be. Um, and this is actually the, the directive we're going to talk about today most. It's not the renewable energy directive, but it's mostly the fuel quality directive, which we, which we will turn to in a second. And um, I just mentioned that the first attempt to introduce biofuels in the European Union was unsuccessful because the member states were, uh, were unwilling to comply with the, with the targeted um, uh, values for replacing um, conventional fuels by biofuels. And one of the reasons, as I just explained, was that uh, the, um, biofuels were criticized for being produced in an unsustainable manner. So um, the main difference between the uh, first directive uh, adopted in 2003 and the one uh, adopted in 2009 was that the European Union this time also defined sustainability criteria for biofuels and bioliquids. So they, they kind of wanted to address the concerns expressed by some member states and also increase um, political and, and public acceptance uh, of biofuels, and we will see shortly how successful they were uh, in doing this. So um, the, this background, um, which just outlined the, the role the European Union has played, um, is actually meant to motivate a basic assumption um, which, which actually underlies uh, the, the rest of this presentation and the research questions which, which I will um, address. It is the, it is this assumption that the introduction of E10 um, is actually a policy-driven process. So um, E10, the uh, blend fuel type, which contains up to 10% bioethanol, um, is not an innovation by industry, but it is actually um, a product which was um, supplied by the industry in response to policy requirements. Therefore, the assumption here is that the introduction of this new fuel type was policy driven. So it was not an industrial um, innovation, but it's a policy innovation. And the, the policymakers had to approach uh, the fossil fuel industry um, to help them uh, that they would supply um, fuels which, uh, which, uh, which are in line with the quality requirements as defined by the Fuel Quality Directive of 2009. So um, what we will now do is we want to take a look at um, how this new fuel type was introduced in one of the free countries which so far have adopted uh, E10. And uh, so uh, there are three countries that have adopted it. One is France, uh, the other one is Finland, and the third one is Germany. In France and in Finland, the introduction of E10 uh, went very smoothly. There were no problems. Uh, there was no public opposition. There was no political opposition. So everything just went fine. 
remarkably, um, the exact opposite happened uh, in the case of Germany. So um, if we just remember the first, uh, one of the first slides I showed you, I'm just uh, flipping back now the slides here, uh, where we could see that Germany is actually uh, the, the third largest producer of biofuels. Um, this this came very much as a surprise for two reasons. First, because there has been um, a, a biofuels industry in place in Germany for a long time, and it was mostly for biodiesel, which is used by trucks, um, but not by, by passenger cars. And the, the other reason is that Germany is known to be a very green state. So there is an influential Green Party in Germany. People uh, uh, are concerned a lot with environmental protection, with climate change. And, uh, and therefore, uh, one would have thought that Germany uh, is a country where people are very willing to, to embrace um, a, f a fuel type which is meant to reduce uh, carbon emissions and to protect the climate. Um, this was not the case. I can already tell you that. Uh, things uh, went uh, very wrong um, right from the beginning. And that had also to do with how um, biofuels were, were introduced to the German market. And they were introduced by, by policymakers. And the policymakers um, adopted a specific framing strategy. So they, they, they associated E10 with um, certain topics. They emphasized certain benefits. And so so the first research question I'm, I would like to address here for the rest of this presentation is which framing strategies did the German government adopt when introducing E10? And, uh, and the second research question is how this framing strategy affected the public's acceptance of E10. And uh, I hope um, by addressing these two questions, I will provide uh, some insights which are uh, not as standard as many other uh, treatises of, of biofuels. So how, how was uh, this new fuel type introduced? So uh, it all began in October 2010 when there was a joint press declaration released by the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation, Building, and Nuclear Safety, and the, German, uh, the General German Automobile Club. It's a very influential club. Germans love their cars. So uh, most, uh, most people who own a car, who drive a car, are also members of the, of the General German Automobile Club, which is abbreviated uh, ADAC. And so it was actually a smart and, and very, very uh, right move of, uh, of, the, of the competent ministry to approach the ADAC so that they would produce a joint press declaration. So the press declaration announced the adoption of an ordinance that aims to implement the European Fuel Quality Directive. And it, it explained that gasoline with a bioethanol share um, of up to 10% will be available at German filling stations from January 2011 onwards. So um, E10 was framed in a very particular way. So um, there were three statements uh, made in this, uh, in this document. So the first one was that biofuels currently in use would produce fewer greenhouse gas emissions than conventional fuels. So there was uh, a framing which would um, associate E10, the new fuel type, with um, climate protection. The second frame which was used was one where um, the ministry and the ADAC claimed that biofuels would reduce dependence on uh, increasingly scarce crude oil so that they would increase um, energy security. And the third frame uh, used by, uh, by these two um, actors was that biofuels uh, are obtained from plants cultivated in a sustainable way in Europe. So they wanted to avoid any criticism that, uh, that could be related to, um, to, um, to claims that biofuels are produced in an unsustainable way in the global south. So this is what they paid attention to. We, there, these were the three messages conveyed to uh, German car drivers. What the declaration did not mention was uh, the, the the very prominent food versus fuel debate, so that um, uh, biofuels are produced from from crops which otherwise could be used to produce um, food products. And uh, and now comes a really interesting um, aspect of the declaration. Um, 
which closed with uh, with the following warning notice. So this is what what uh, what was uh, stated in the press release. So this is a direct quote from it. So um, the ministry and the ADAC they stated the following. So I'm reading. I'm going to read this out loud. They said that around 90% of all petrol-powered petrol passenger cars can use E10 without any restrictions. Generally speaking, new cars are compatible with E10. Drivers of petrol-powered cars should make sure that their vehicle is compatible with E10 before purchasing E10 fuel for the first time. So uh, as you might have guessed already, this warning notice caused a lot of uncertainty uh, and uh, and people uh, were so uh, like concerned about this warning notice that they simply did not purchase e10 the new uh, the new fuel type they were they were afraid that their engines would be damaged if they used the new fuel and um, and so what happened was they went to the filling stations and they demanded the conventional fuel type which is super uh, 95 um, and uh, but 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 the problem was that the filling stations did not order enough um, supply of super 95, but instead they had uh, they had um, they had uh, a lot of supply of E10, but the car drivers did not want to uh, did not want to purchase E10. So there was a mismatch in demand and supply, and the result of this was that the German filling stations, for a period of about uh, two to three weeks, were uh, sold out with uh, with uh, conventional fuel, which is Super 95, uh, and they they had too much E10 in stock, and so you could see cars queuing in front of um, of the filling stations. People were very annoyed with the situation. There was a mass panic breaking out because uh, many car drivers thought that um, they, they will not get enough, um, enough, um, enough of the conventional fuel um, to tank their cars. And, uh, and so there was panic and chaos at the filling stations. What happened in parallel is the following, that, um, that uh, environmental groups such as um, Greenpeace, for example, they started a campaign in Germany where they said um, that, um, that biofuels have a negative impact on, on, uh, on, um, on food production and that, uh, that, uh, that people must abstain from using biofuels because you're destroying uh, f uh, crops which could otherwise be used used for, uh, for food production. So what they did was they started a campaign which was directed at uh, one of the frames which was not addressed by the, by the, Euro by the German policymaker, which is the so-called food versus fuel debate. So two problems occurred at the same time. The first one was that uh, car drivers, they did not accept the new fuel type. Um, so, um, so the industry um, kind of um, had problems in, in convincing the car drivers that the new fuel type would be safe and could be could be purchased without problems by car drivers. And the second um, development was that environmental groups started to mobilize against biofuels. So. Um, the reactions can be summarized as follows. So there was a boycott of E10, which led uh, to conventional Super E95 being sold out. Two online petitions were launched to stop immediately the sale of E10. Car magazines and the general media criticized the introduction of E10 a lot. And the media adopted the food versus fuel debate, uh, which was then revived um, a, a, few, uh, a few years later, actually. Sorry, I, I have a typo here. It should say 2012, actually, uh, when the Minister of Development and Economic Co uh, Cooperation um, demanded E10 to be banned as well because, uh, because he said that E10 um, has very negative uh, implications for food production. So this is what happened in Germany, something which was not foreseen by policymakers. 
So um, let's take a look at the introduction process in terms of like how, how the policymakers behaved. So what the German government did was they engaged in framing, uh, but they mostly invoked the frames uh, with regard to climate change mitigation and also increasing um, energy security. Then uh, the German government was actually um, very thoughtful in, in forming a coalition with the ADAC, which is the relevant interest organization, which has um, a, a huge membership base, actually. Uh, but what the German government did not address in in the in the um, in the press release, which was meant to to introduce E10, was the food versus fuel debate. And what the what, uh, another mistake uh, which the German government um, committed was, and this was clearly a mistake and something uh, which which I hardly can explain to myself why they did this, is that they asked the car drivers to inform themselves about potential engine engine damages, which created um, uh, an atmosphere of mistrust. And, uh, and, um, and so the, the overall acceptance of E10 was very low. So we can clearly summarize that the communication strategy of the German government had flaws. But the key actors also displayed an inconsistent behavior. So um, first of all, the ADAC, which was one of the uh, one of the uh, signatures of the press release, um, uh, also changed camps. So in the beginning, they were very much in favor of E10, but later on, uh, they joined uh, the skepticism of car drivers and. Um, and also suspected that E10 could lead to more um, engine damages than the, than the German government would admit. Um, but then also uh, the, the policymakers were very inconsistent. So on the one hand, we had the, the Ministry of, um, of, uh, of Energy and uh, of Economy. Um, like uh, this was the, the, the competent ministry introducing the, the new fuel type. So they were very much in favor of E10. But the Ministry for, um, for Development and Foreign Aid opposed it. So also the signals sent by the policymakers were not very coherent. Uh, and all these errors added up to an uh, enormous level of mistrust among German citizens, which was reflected in the low demand for E10 and also in the, in the public's uh, negative opinion on it. So um, I'm right now showing you um, the um, uh, survey, which was fielded in 2011. And it was fielded by a, a very well-known uh, opinion um, uh, poll company called Infratest DMAP. And so they asked in 2011 like, what the attitude of Germans was towards uh, the new uh, uh, biofuel E10, or the, the blend fuel type, actually. And so as you can see, I, I don't think I need to read this out. You can do this yourself. Um, so what they do in this question is um, they first explain a little bit like what E10 is about. They explain that it is blended with 10% um, bioethanol, or here they just say ethanol. They explain how it is, um, how it is actually um, derived. And then they ask um, the, the, the respondents whether they find it justifiable that, uh, that we kind of use this uh, new fuel type to lower carbon dioxide emissions, or whether the respondents would find it unjustifiable, uh, given that there is a shortage uh, of food in the world and an increase of food prices. So um, just ignoring for the time being that the wording of this survey question is not ideal, we can talk about this later at the Q&A. I have also some critical remarks on it. But for, for the time being, I would just invite you to focus on um, the, respondents, uh, the, the responses given by the respondents. And here you can see that 69% uh, of the respondents have replied that this would not be justifiable, and only 25% found it justifiable, so giving you a relatively clear uh, idea about uh, the, the, the public's opinion on E10. 
2012, there was another survey um, asking um, a question which is a bit better worded and which is more interesting because it, uh, if you take a look at the third bullet point, uh, you can see that the response uh, categories uh, offered to the respondents were a bit more nuanced. So 64% of the respondents said that they were in favor of banning E10, and 13% uh, said that they were, were against uh, this demand of banning E10. But, uh, but what makes this question uh, a bit more interesting compared to the previous one is that the respondents could not only um, express whether they were uh, in favor or against E10 um, because of its uh, implications for climate change and food production, but what we have here is that uh, that the respondents could also say that they are against biofuels for other reasons than food security. And this is actually an important uh, response category from my perspective, um, because if we just remember what we heard um, um, so far, that many Germans actually rejected E10 because they were concerned that their engines would not work with the new fuel type. And this, this survey question makes more sense because it shows us that uh, a, a great majority of respondents are against um, E10 because they, uh, they are concerned with regard to food security, but we see that about one quarter of the respondents are also uh, against this new fuel type because uh, they, they, they might be concerned because of technical, um, of technical reasons because they think their, their engines might be damaged. But, uh, but compared to 2011, uh, when we take a look at the response rates here, or the response patterns actually, we can see that um, the, when asked in 2012, the German public was even less accepting of, uh, of biofuels in 2012. Okay, so um, I, I, I kind of um, thought it would be nice to analyze the survey um, data information which I just uh, presented to you, and I came up with five expectations, so for factors which might explain when, uh, when individuals are uh, accepting of E10 and when they are uh, rather unwilling to accept them. So um, I thought that um, individuals who are concerned with climate change will have a positive attitude towards E10 because this is like this was one of the main motivations. Then I thought that the supporters of the government parties who were ruling at that time uh, would have a positive attitude towards E10. So uh, the government that, that introduced E10 was one consisting of the Christian um, Democratic Party and the Liberal Democratic Party. So I thought the supporters of these two parties would also support E10. Uh, then um, my idea was that individuals who, gen who are generally satisfied with the government will have a positive attitude towards E10. And finally, um, I thought that individuals who have a negative perception of the economic situation will have a positive attitude towards E10. This has to do with the fact that E10 is, is cheaper than, uh, than conventional fuel, as, some, as a portion up to 10% um, is replaced by bioethanol, which is much cheaper in production than, uh, than fossil fuels. So I quickly present you the, the results of my analysis. So, um, the, the, the dotted line in the middle shows you uh, the, the zero line, so we have estimates for the individual variables, so these are estimates for the coefficients, and only coefficients that do not cross the, the uh, zero, um, uh, zero um, line are so-called significant coefficients. And what we see um, here is that individuals who had um, bad uh, ex uh, had uh, expectations that the economy would, uh, would worsen in the future had a higher likelihood of supporting E10. And also individuals who thought that the federal government was doing a good job. So two of the hypotheses um, could be confirmed here. And when taking a look at the data for 2012, what we see here is that the um, that the the, the 
the, the coefficient for the variable, which indicates if in, uh, individuals are concerned with environmental and climate issues, uh, that they are more likely or less likely to oppose E10 than individuals uh, that uh, pay less attention to environmental issues. So this means that the voters who care a lot about environmental protection and climate change are also the, the voters that do support E10. The other voters um, are, are more skeptical about this. And I don't think, also because the time has advanced a lot, I don't think that I need to discuss the other coefficients at this point in time, but I'm happy to come back to the estimation findings when we turn to the, to the Q&A session. So um, to give you an overview of the, uh, of the findings, um, so we, we can confirm that um, attitudes towards climate change and environmental protection matters for how um, Germans feel uh, about E10. And we have some support that, uh, that uh, individuals who are generally satisfied with the government will also have a positive attitude towards E10. And we have mixed findings uh, with regard to the fifth hypothesis. So for 2011, we could show that this relationship holds true. Um, for 2012, the findings pointed into the other direction. Therefore, the findings here are mixed. But, uh, but the most important uh, takeaway message here is that of the very few uh, individuals who support E10 in Germany, um, the, 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 we, can, we can say that they are special to the extent that these are the individuals that are very much concerned about environmental protection and climate change. So if people support E10 at all, it is because they have uh, strong feelings about protecting the climate, and that's the main message of this analysis here. Okay, so um, let's, let's uh, start wrapping everything up. So we can say that the German government made an effort to frame E10 as a means to lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this framing strategy seems uh, to have worked out. And uh, so um, I, would, I would draw the more general conclusion from this that um, uh, that there is something which we would uh, consider as reluctant acceptance. So if you can explain to um, car drivers that uh, biofuels or biofuel blend, uh, blended um, or bioethanol blended fuel types, that they have positive effects uh, for, for protecting the climate, uh, respondents are much more uh, supportive of biofuels. So this is something I would label as reluctant acceptance, and this is um, actually something we could also observe with nuclear power. So when you usually ask people about nuclear power, uh, they are against it. But once you explain people that nuclear power can help to, to limit greenhouse gas emissions, they seem to be more accepting of nuclear power. And this is um, this, uh, this phenomenon of reluctant acceptance, which we can also observe for biofuels. So these are the conclusions. We can see that framing strategies matter a lot for policy-driven uh, for a policy-driven launch of new uh, uh, fossil of, of, uh, policy-driven launch of um, fuel products, we see what the framing strategy was uh, about uh, uh, in this case, and uh, we also see that. Um, Public acceptance can be affected greatly by uh, communication in mistakes, and therefore um, we need to pay more attention to how, um, how new products are actually launched on the market. This would be it from my side. Thank you so much for your attention, and now I look forward to your questions.